Welcome to our show today where I interview Andy Curtis Payne. Andy is such an interesting person to me because he has all these years of experience. He's been in high levels of government within yoga organizations. And yet what we talk about today is so simple, so common sense. It seems like you wouldn't even need to tell people the things that we talk about. And yet they are so profound and they change the trajectory of people's lives. So it really got me thinking about a conversation I had with a massage therapist that I know. And she was saying to me the other day, she really doesn't know what I do or what a yoga therapist is. And she said, you know, in addition to my massage therapy, I want to start doing like meditation teaching and body-mind therapy classes and working with people in one-on-one consultations to help them with better lifestyle choices. She said, but I just don't have a framework from which to offer this. She said, I I don't want to recreate the wheel. There must be something out there that would be a framework I could use. And in my mind, I'm kind of laughing, thinking to myself, that's what yoga therapy is. It's based on the ancient wisdom of really common sense living. How can you keep it simple? How can you take breaks during the day, make sure you're hydrated, get enough sleep, take time for rest during the day, breathe, feel like that's all we're doing as yoga therapists. And if you're going to a yoga therapist, it may seem like, oh my gosh, this is so common sense. But the truth is we have lost ourselves as a society. We are connected to our technology. We are eating all the fast food. We are not sleeping enough. We are not getting out in nature. We're not taking breathing breaks. All the low tech, simple ways of becoming happier and healthier, more present, enjoying our lives, nourishing our lives. It's really so simple and yet we've lost it. And as Andy talks about in this interview, it really has to do with over identifying with something that is not us identifying with that job that we're working 60 or 70 hours a week, identifying with, I have to be the mother of three children and I don't deserve nourishment. I I have to be the martyr. Identifying with the roles that society tells us we need to be. And when we're identified with something outside of ourselves, that becomes our GPS. That becomes the the feedback mechanism to tell us what to do next. And what yoga is saying is you are not those roles. Your GPS is inside of you. And through yoga and yoga therapy, we can help you reconnect in very natural ways to that inner wisdom. That's common sense. But I think We have gotten so far away from that, that we actually need someone to sit with us and teach us how to do it again. Now, ideally, our parents would have done that between ages zero to 18, but because our parents don't know how to do it and they have lost their way and they no longer have an internal compass, they're looking outside for what society tells us we should be doing to feel better. They can't teach it to their children. Most of us didn't learn it. So when I came to yoga and yoga therapy and realized that that's what is going on, I spent the first 10 years learning how to do it for myself, learning how to nourish myself, take time for myself, feel valuable enough to be able to take time for myself. Like I'm I'm gonna tell something that's a little bit embarrassing, but when I first started and couldn't get myself to do a daily practice, I basically told myself, Amy, this is part of your work day. You have to do this in order to be a yoga therapist. So I didn't do it for the internal GPS. I didn't do it for the nourishment. I actually made it a job task. And that's how I got started because that's where I was at the time. Now, over several decades of studying this and teaching it and becoming it, now I can do that for myself and I can teach others how to do that. But the truth is it's very low tech. 
It's very common sense. And yet it's exactly what our world needs. So I have great joy out of taking these ancient, ancient teachings and bringing them to the world through a yoga therapy school and watching people transform from the inside out and reconnect to their inner GPS. That gives me great joy. And when I tell people what I do, oh, I help them hydrate and stop and take breathing breaks and meditate and get a good night's sleep and make better choices and not be owned by the wine or the coffee. Instead, you can make a choice. Like it doesn't even sound that fancy. It doesn't sound like much, but it's a big deal. And it's almost indescribable with words. And so I think Andy and myself really unpack this with a beautiful interview that I will listen to again and again. There's so much wisdom and depth in what Andy shares with us. And I'm just really glad to have you hear this interview. And, you know, if you're out there thinking that maybe you should try yoga therapy to come home to yourself, please, please, please do it. Everyone should do this. You do need a helping hand. Or maybe you're thinking about a new career and you're like, wow, that sounds kind of cool. I might want to try that. Well, contact us. We'll help educate you about this thing called yoga therapy and how you can help others do this. Now, with that said, you yourself will have to go through the transformation process while you learn how to do it for others. You can't bypass, like, I don't deserve nourishment and I'm not going to do these simple little things and I can't do a daily practice, but I'm going to help teach others how to do that. Mm, That doesn't quite work. (laughs) We catch you and we say, nope, you got to learn to do it for you before you can pass that candlelight on to another. So I hope you enjoy this interview and we'd love to get your feedback. And if there's anything you want to tell us, you can always email yoga at amywheeler.com and we'll be happy to listen. So thanks for joining us. Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour. My name is Amy Wheeler and I'm your host. The Yoga Therapy Hour is here to support you on your mental, emotional, and spiritual journey. We talk about things like nervous system regulation, spiritual connection, how to be more involved in your community, how to communicate well, how to manage your mental health. There are so many things that we are excited to share with you in season five of the Yoga Therapy Hour podcast, and we hope that you will share it with your friends, family, colleagues. All right, let's get into today's episode. I welcome you. Do you go by Andrew or Andy? If I hear Andrew, it sounds like my mother telling me off. So, <laughs> Andy, <my laughs> Okay, Andy. <laughs> so, Andy Curtis Payne, and you're located in Sussex? Yeah, near the south coast in the UK, probably about 35 miles south of London. Mm, Beautiful. And Andy, how long have you been the chair of the Society of Yoga Practitioners, one of my favorite groups over there? That started in January 2013. And you've done it the whole time till now? No, I handed over to a lady called B. Chewton about three years ago. He has recently handed over to Karen Worthy. When we set up the organization with the Constitution, initially we said that someone could only hold the chair for three years. Mm. But unfortunately, after my first three years, we couldn't find anyone to take it. So I carried it for another four and a half years, so seven and a half years total. And then eventually, thankfully, someone came forward. Yeah, It was a big challenge for me because... I am basically just a yoga teacher and I haven't ever had a proper professional role as such working in a large institution. So helping to set up and chair an organization was a big learning experience. And I bow down to you because this volunteerism is so time consuming. It takes over your life and people don't understand how much of your life force you give to promote the field and the teachings. Absolutely. Yeah, I, you do. I mean, it was difficult at times, but you do have to try and ring fence things a bit. 
I was very fortunate in as much as having a really good team of people around me who I could count on to help me and support me. Because at the same time, I was running two concurrent teacher training courses and my own practice as well. So, yeah, it was a period of intensity, Amy, shall we say. I had that at the International Association of Yoga Therapists and I was on the board for six years. And by the end of the sixth year, I had chronic pain. I did not feel well. No, I think this is one of the challenges that we face in the modern world really is if you are a committed, sincere, caring person, it's very hard to know when to say, no, now I have to think of me. Yeah. And I think this is one of the things that yoga and the teachings of yoga can actually help us explore and find is what are the boundaries. Yes. Self-care is a hugely important thing and something that yoga is very eloquent about and very good at. But that resounds with me very much. I wasn't ill, but I was certainly ready to stop. Let's put it that way when it came to it. Yeah. And B and Karen are both such lovely women. Absolutely. I'm very happy that they're there now doing what I don't have to anymore. And I'm really enjoying now being able to devote my time to the things that I absolutely love, which is both the teaching of yoga in terms of being a trainer, but also just working with everybody, anybody. I don't like to say ordinary people because it almost sounds like derogatory, but just whoever is interested, I want to talk to them and help them see how some very simple ideas can actually make quite a profound difference to someone's life. Well, let's start there because when I saw your brief answers to my questions, that is really the one that stood out to me the most. And you said your, I don't know if you called it your gift, but the way you work is to keep it simple. What does that mean to you? Absolutely. So if I have an inquiry from someone and they say they have a problem, let's say it's insomnia, I will chat with them. I will meet them in a little cabin at the end of the garden, which is where I'm speaking to you from now. But I won't necessarily reference yoga. I certainly won't use any Sanskrit terms. We will simply have a conversation about how the person's feeling where they are at the moment in their life, what's been happening recently that's significant, and then start to explore some ideas that are inspired by yoga to actually help bring the person back into balance. Because most of the problems we see that people come with now are simply because there is an imbalance somewhere in their life. Very often, work. And we've just talked about that briefly, our own personal experience. So. Yeah. We seem to have a very strange problem in the UK at the moment, and I don't know how it is for you guys in the US, but people are either can't get enough work or they have so much work, this crazy situation. So helping people to see where they are and then helping them to explore what they can do to bring that balance back. So keeping technical terms out of it or to an absolute minimum Whereas obviously if I'm working as a trainer, I have to use those terms because the people I'm teaching need to know them. So if I'm working in my everyday practice, it's really about the person, what do they need, where are they, and trying to find the simplest, easiest solution for that person. And this is something that's inspired by TKV Jessica Char. He would never make things overly complicated because he realized very sensibly that particularly in this modern world, time and energy are two of our most, if you like, precious resources. And very few people have too much time or too much energy. So if we're going to help someone, we have to be, if you like, efficient and effective. So many things that I'd like to touch on. The first one being that you as a yoga teacher trainer, or even a yoga therapy trainer, you're going to probably be using Sanskrit and talking about all the ancient models of healing, the Mala Agni Prana model. And, and yeah, you have absolutely. all that knowledge in your mind. You've spent decades developing. Absolutely. Knowledge. Absolutely. But when you meet someone with insomnia, 
that's all in the background. And you talk about very common sense things like, how's your job going? Are you overworking? And just basically things like what's their routine? What's their daily routine? Do they exercise? When do they eat? And particularly if we're dealing with insomnia, what happens from about 6 p.m. onwards? Because what's been shown in research now is that actually this period before sleep can really affect the quality of the sleep when we go to bed. So it's almost like in a yoga practice, if we want to do something specific, we would take steps to prepare for it. The same idea is important for, so we now all know, I think that screens, blue screens particularly, we have to be thoughtful about, is someone in a very stimulating environment. For some people, it helps to turn the light levels down if they have sound, reduce the sound, things like that. So there is that gradual progression from everyday activity and being focused to taking the person to where they need to be so that they're actually ready to sleep. And that could very well include just sitting on the edge of the bed, taking some simple breathing exercises just to change the energy of mind before the person actually lies down. What I'm thinking of as I hear you speak is that these really simple, low technology approaches to health and healing, they're almost so simple that people wouldn't even think they could work. Like sitting on your bed and taking 12 long exhale breaths before you lie down. Like it's so simple. It's free. Like I, I think people might even say, well, what could that do? Exactly. And people are very surprised. And I think you've hit on a very important point there, Amy, that we have become, for me, rather over-sophisticated. And we now think that if something isn't expensive or complicated, is it worth having? Is it worth buying into? Can it really help? And I think for me, one of the very great joys of working in this field is seeing how these very simple ideas, particularly working with the breath. I mean, what could be more basic than the breath? Our life begins the first time we breathe in. The breath is with us throughout our life. We say goodbye to this world when we exhale for the last time. And yet by befriending the breath, getting to know it and learning to use it, it can transform our lives. That's another question I wanted to ask you. What is a reasonable outcome? Like from starting to just practice simple breathing techniques, you say it can transform your life. Let's unpack that. Let's stick with the idea of the insomnia. We now know, again, there's plenty of search out there, that that sleep is critical to well-being. And there are lots of figures out there to show that actually, although people don't report as true or chronic insomnia. Many, many people have varying degrees of sleep difficulty. Now, what this means is this then long-term bounces over into the rest of my life, how effective I can be, how I can concentrate, my mood, the quality of my relationships. All of those things over a period of time can become impacted. So if you can simply help someone to have a better night's sleep on a regular basis, all of those other things are then nourished and enhanced simply because the person feels properly rested and no longer stressed. So again, it's relatively simple. And when people come to see me, as I'm sure you do, we have a pro forma, a consultation form, and there are really three key areas that we look at when we first meet people. One of them is the quality of sleep, digestion and elimination, and physical activity. Because these key areas can really illustrate how well the person is, and they're fundamental to the well-being of the whole person. So if someone is digesting well, eliminating well, we know that physiologically there can't be anything too badly wrong. If they sleep well, that's an indication that the mind is actually basically okay. There may be some instabilities here and there, but if someone sleeps well on a regular basis, has good digestion, good elimination, that's a good indication that they are fundamentally well. Whereas if we see imbalances in those areas, that's where we need to pay attention. 
the words that come to me are like back to the basics. Can you sleep? Absolutely. Can you poop? And can you move? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because for me, fundamentally, this model that we have, there are two of us there, you ladies and, and us gentlemen, but we haven't really evolved greatly as far as anyone can tell since we were hunter-gatherers. We have the same basic biological space suit for living in this realm. And of course, those people were designed for a very different life to the one we lead today. Mm. Far more physical activity and far less mental stimulation. And I think it's that area where the imbalance comes for so many people. And what I see again and again, Amy, looking broadly at the population, is that many of the problems that occur are because the body is either underused or misused and the mind is overstimulated. I'm into that. You know, if someone wakes up in the morning, the radio, whatever the computer's on, I've stayed sometimes with friends, relatives, and I'll see them sitting on the laptop in bed before they've even cleaned their teeth, got up, they haven't even been to the bathroom, they're on the phone. And so it goes on through the whole day, and now we can have communications in the car, and then you're in the office or whatever, and there is never a moment for some people when they can just be conscious, awake, but not stimulated or engaged. And for me, that is not natural. I believe it's important that we have periods of time in the day when we can just stop, not for a long time, maybe 10 minutes, sit on a bench in the sun or sit under a tree, preferably somewhere outside, and just be with ourselves for a moment and remember what that feels like. Is this common sense? Have we forgotten common sense? I think these are things that were once more part of our everyday lives. And whilst I don't want to sound like too much of a Luddite, I do think technology is a very double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. It allows a lot of amazing things, and certainly in terms of medical treatment and medical research, I, for one, would not want to wind back the clock. I think what we now have access to is truly amazing. However, as I've said, the danger is because something's possible, people find it very hard and we can very easily find ourselves drawn into situations and become, if not actually addicted, habituated to quite high levels of stimulation. And because this is happening all around us, this becomes normal. And I think now a lot of the issues we're seeing, particularly with problems of the nervous system and mental health, are partly to do with this overstimulation. I uh, completely agree. And, and I have to tell you a funny story. It's serendipitous that this is coming up, but a lot of times in the morning, I kind of just want to check first thing and make sure there's no fires to put out. And then I'll want to like go to my practice and, you know, do my morning routine. But this morning when I was doing that first kind of check, just, okay, are there any crazy emails, anything I need to pay attention to? I feel like I can relax into my practice. Somebody basically said, Hey, if you're looking at technology first thing in the morning, you need to stop. You need to go outside in nature, go on a walk, talk about what's going to make you happy. So I shut it down. I took that message and I said to my husband on our walk today, I want to talk about the things that are going to make us happy today. Mm. I even do it. I, I want to jump on first thing in the morning to put out any and, fires. And this is what I mean. And this is why one of the important gifts that, that yoga teaches is to be conscious and in the moment. Now, when I say conscious, I don't mean as opposed to unconscious, but mm. to really be present with what we're doing so that we can be aware of, A, the effect it's having on us, mm. and B, that we're giving a quality of attention to whichever task is in front of us at the time. And this is something that's represented in a teaching called the Bhagavad Gita, which you will be familiar with where there are some definitions of yoga, and one of them is skill in action, that we act appropriately to whatever situation we find ourselves in. But that can only happen if we can bring our attention fully into that moment. And this is something that we can learn in a yoga practice. 
we can take some simple movement of the body and breath, coordinate the body and breath together, which helps to hold the mind in the practice, but also helps to harmonize all those basic functions we were talking about earlier, respiration, circulation, digestion, elimination. So again, very simply, we can come back into ourselves, nourish ourselves in a very simple way, such that then we learn what that actually feels like. Because I feel for many people, this is quite an alien experience. We, we live in quite a kind of disconnected way, fragmented way. And many people have become very specialized in certain roles in their lives. And that becomes very dominant and therefore other aspects of their lives become neglected. And this again can become the cause of imbalances eventually that build up into the system. And sadly, often we don't realize they're there until they manifest as some kind of pathology. Exactly. I just want to go back and repeat what you said, because I think it's, I know for me, this has been aha moment over and over and over that we identify with certain roles, whether that be a mother or a father or this kind of person at work or a volunteer person that is the head of, you know, IOIT or the chair of society of yoga practitioners. We get so identified with that, mm -hmm. that we lose the connection with who am I beyond my roles. Absolutely. And that is why I think those moments in the day where we just sit with ourselves are so important because it's very easy, particularly if you do have a very demanding role. And by that, I mean being the mother of three young children. I'm not just talking about CEOs and presidents. Yeah, those guys are busy, but they also have a whole team of people to help them. But if you take a young mother with three kids and she's in the house on their own, that can be one of the most demanding situations anyone can find themselves in. And it can be a wonderful role, but it can also be draining. And even a mother of three young children is still herself within that role and needs time to be herself and to nourish herself so that she can nourish the children and others. And again, this is a basic principle that yoga teaches. And one of the reasons I believe why yoga practice was traditionally taken very early in the morning so that the person could nourish themselves first then go into the world in that better state to fulfill all those different roles. But let's take the mother who has given all of her time, energy, focus, attention to the well-being of her children. Mm. When you work with her, like I have women say to me, I don't know what you're talking about. When Amy, you say, who are you? Not separate from that role, but who are you? Who do you take into that role? Like they have no idea that there even is a self beyond that role. So how do you work with someone to help them kind of come back to home? There are some ideas uh, again and again, I will during this interview, come back to the breath because it is so fundamental. And there's a very beautiful idea, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with. It's presented in the ancient teachings on yoga, which talks about the life energy within each of us being the friend of the soul or the friend of the spirit. Therefore, if we can form an intimate relationship with the breath and follow metaphorically the breath inside, that can bring us into a space where there is a chance of sensing, feeling, or being aware of something else, one's true self. I love that you answered the question with a way to get there. Instead of saying, here's the target I intellectually want you to try to find, people can't find that target. But when you say sensing and feeling your breath inside, just do that. Yeah, exactly. In other words, get the person out of the head, back into the body. And sometimes I will teach or suggest someone just breathe in, feel the breath move down the throat into the heart. As you breathe out, simply rest in the space of the heart. Mm. Just something as simple as that. 
you know, no techniques, no fancy words, just let the breath take you back to yourself in a word. You're feeling your way and sensing your way back, not thinking your way back. Yeah, exactly. Because then that gets us into a place where we can be more self-empathic. Mm. We can start to think, actually, I, I deserve a bit of time. I deserve a bit of energy. I, I deserve a bit of attention. So, yes, trying to almost kind of circumvent the mind at that stage rather than trying to tackle the mind head on, which I think is extremely problematic, and just come back to some really almost primal feelings and cutting through and coming back to a sense of center, a sense of self. And again, there the language is very important. This is a very individualized experience. And I believe as facilitators, we have to be careful not to try and suggest too much to the person. This is their journey. Very loose framework to encourage them to try and find and explore what it is for them that is going to nourish them. I've found through such a simple technique, as you say, just inhale, nose, throat, down into the heart space, and then exhale and just feel that people burst into tears. That's right. Yeah. And this is because it's, for me, I think it's a bit of a shock as a society, so detached from that part of ourselves that when we even get close to it, it's kind of like, whoa, and it can be a bit of a shock. So again, there, I think as facilitators, teachers, therapists, whatever role we're in, I think we have to be mindful that it can happen and just be there and create a safe environment for the person to be able to express what they need to express at that time. And this is something that took me a while to learn and a while to be comfortable with. Initially, I was a little bit, when the first happened, I was a little bit challenged and like, whoa, I wasn't ready for that. And so I had to educate myself. That's fine. And actually, in a way, I believe it's a compliment to the, the therapist or the teacher that the person feels safe enough and relaxed enough at that point just to be able, because like you, I've had this experience many times that people come in and they are so burdened that it needs that release before they can begin to articulate why it is they're feeling like that. These techniques are simple, but what Desika Char taught me and many others is simple is often very powerful and profound. And as you rightly alluded to earlier, in the modern era, we so often overlook that. You know, the word simple has been used, unfortunately, to denigrate people. Simplicity is a great gift. In this modern world, where most of us are overwhelmed, overworked, overstimulated, just to know that I can go to a 10 or 15 minute breath practice and all I have to do is breathe and feel mm. is such a gift. Absolutely. Absolutely. And a lovely lady called Jill Lloyd, who I worked with as my teacher for many years, once said, the greatest gift you can give someone is their breath. And that is, is so true, you know, because as I say, it's with us everywhere. So if you're in a traffic jam on the freeway, if you're in a consultory room waiting to see the dentist, if you're sitting on the tarmac and the plane's delayed, whatever it is, whatever these situations, you can just close your eyes, place a hand on the abdomen and just connect breath and just bring yourself back into the moment, bring yourself back down and just find a moment of peace. So many of the themes you're talking about, we just talked about with Michael Hutchinson. You have discussed this, but it's kind of ironic how this idea of just tune into your breath and many things happen, many good things happen. And I believe that's because in a way, and one of the ancient models from yoga presents this, the idea that you'll have come across of the Panchamaya that says that we manifest in five ways. And when we look at that model, it's easy to see that the one thing that permeates all levels and unites them is the breath, because every cell in our body needs that relationship. Every single cell in our system needs to be nourished and it needs to be cleansed. 
we can sanctify the breath by saying, may each inhale nourish me, may each exhale cleanse me. So if I'm working with someone who's undergoing chemo or something, that's quite a nice, simple practice for them to do. Just let each inhale nourish me, let each exhale cleanse me. And they can use that as often as they want to wherever they are during the day. I find these really simple things, that's what our students remember and use. A student would hear that and use it for two years. Good. And the other nice thing about all these ideas, Amy, is it can empower people at a time when they feel very disempowered. So if someone has a diagnosis like that, it's challenging, it's frightening, it just can blow your world apart. And obviously then we have to see various different consultants, oncologists, this, that, the other. And I've met many people who are going through this process and, and it can make them feel very fragmented. Mm-hmm. It belongs to this consultant, this bit, this. And somehow just a simple practice like that, they can do for themselves. It's theirs. They don't have to get a prescription. They don't have to wait for permission. When they feel the need to connect, and be with themselves, they can. And I think that's one of the the great gifts of yoga is self-empowerment. I can do this for myself. What would you say to a student who simply cannot get themselves to do that for themselves and be self-empowered for even 10 minutes a day? I mean, we have students that we say 10 minutes a day, just start with that and They just can't find a way to do that. Do you have any advice for getting started? Yeah, I think we can take a bit of a clue here from our old friend or your friend and mine, Patanjali. So some people listening may not have heard of Patanjali, but he really collated arguably the most important text ever written on yoga. And in the first chapter, there's a section where he makes various suggestions about things we can do to help ourselves when we're challenged. Interestingly, the first thing he does suggest is some breathing practice. But then if we haven't got time to do that, he goes on to make many other suggestions, reflecting on our dreams, Mm -hmm. uh, looking for inspiration in a role model, someone else, whether they're living or whether they've passed, who we can look at and say, wow, they've managed to do that. I mean, I mean, one of my great inspirations is a lady called Ellen MacArthur. I don't know if you remember the story, but it's maybe 20 years ago now, but this tiny little lady sailed all the way around the world single-handed in a very small boat. And every time I look at pictures of her, I just think that is totally amazing. So we can look for inspiration into the natural world. If someone can't do a practice, maybe before they go to bed, just look out the window at the stars, look at the moon, look at the moon with the clouds moving across it, just something that takes them out of themselves and creates a moment of freedom, a moment of space. And happily for us, at the end of that section in 139, potentially actually says, basically, anything that helps to calm the mind can be useful. Another very clever suggestion by a a colleague of mine once, she was working with someone who had depression, and whatever they tried in terms of a formal indoor practice wouldn't work. And so she suggested that the person walk just around her local neighborhood and look at the different types of front door on the different houses and notice the different colors they sell. Now, a lot of people say, well, how is that yoga practice? So let's look at this. Yoga practice means to break a negative pattern and to engage in something else that helps change the mind. So if that means walking around the neighborhood, looking at different colored front doors, that then is a yoga practice because the person is breaking the pattern of sitting indoors in that very fixed way. So in other words, Amy, it's really down to the creativity of the yoga teacher, therapist, facilitator, whatever you are, 
to try and find something. And Desik Chah was very strong on this. He said, there is always something. And he would talk about it like that pinprick of light that a star is in the dark night sky. We just have to find that pinprick mm -hmm. or have a person find it, and then it can open out. But it's a very common problem. And, yeah, some people find it very difficult to self-nourish. Yes. I think that's the crux of the issue right there. Yeah, me it's too. foreign to take time to sit and be and feel the sunshine on your face and breathe mm. for 10 minutes. Like we are so overstimulated and overworked that we don't even know how to nourish ourselves at the most basic level anymore. And what we've done is outsourced most of that because now we go to supermarkets and buy pre-prepared food. So not only do we not know where it was grown or how it was grown, but we don't know what else has been added to it, taken away from it before we get to it. We outsource our health care to other people. We have insurance. So it doesn't matter if I get ill because the insurance company, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, I think it is a fundamental matter of when we feel challenged, taking stock and thinking, okay, what's going on here? What is really important in my life? If I lose my sense of self, my sense of health, my well-being, what have I got? And yoga very much sees uh, a human incarnation, a chance to live in this way, as one of the greatest gifts that can be bestowed upon us. Because it's said that only in this way can we actually become self-realized, can we learn these lessons so in a way, we can look at this life and this world as like a huge schoolroom. We're here to experience, yes, and to enjoy, of course, because any education should hopefully be a good experience. It should be varied. It should be enjoyable. But we should develop. We should grow. We should learn. And I think that's what you mean when you say a reasonable outcome of this work is that you would understand yourself better. You would understand, here's how to nourish myself and en enjoy this embodied experience of being human. And mm -hmm. there is also a spiritual, if you want to call it spiritual, you wouldn't have to call it spiritual, but there's another path also, self-development or growth or connection to something higher than yourself. I tend to phrase it these days, Amy, as exploring one's highest potential mm -hmm. because that's nice and open. So does that mean being the best Andy I can or the best Amy I can? Or does it mean that maybe there's something more? And because yoga is a path and a journey, when people ask me that question about are you spiritual, are you this, are you that, I just say I'm on this path. I've gained so much from it. I've learned so much from it. I'm just interested in continuing on the path to see what else it has to offer. So I can't say to someone, yes, there is this enlightened being inside of me and, and I'm definitely going to meet it because I can't evidence that. I can't know it. But what I do know is that if I look after my very basic needs of reasonable nourishment, reasonable rest, reasonable activities, I enjoy life more. Life becomes richer. I see more. I hear more. I smell more. I taste more. So even at a very ordinary, everyday level, if I'm more connected with whatever it is I'm doing, whether it's having a nice cup of coffee or eating some nice fruit from the garden, that experience becomes richer and I value it rather than being in a situation where I've got a takeaway coffee in one hand and a sandwich in the other and I'm sat at the desk and I'm, this is not a criticism, not a judgment, more an observation because I've been there myself, sitting in a car, driving from one appointment to the next with a cup of coffee balanced there and trying to eat a sandwich there and follow the traffic and that. And it's like, I've tried it. I didn't like it. My system didn't like it. So now I don't do it. Right. And I'm not saying this is easy. I've now been practicing yoga. I'm 62 this year. 
And I began practicing yoga when I was in my mid to late twenties. So, so quite a long time, three decades plus. And it has been a journey. It's been an evolution. And I think that's okay. That's why we have a life is so we can take our time to get to know ourselves, to learn to understand ourselves so that we can live more skillfully, more carefully, more thoughtfully. Discrimination is a very big part of yoga. It's something that's talked about many, many times. And for me, a simpler way to look at that is choice. Can I choose? Do I have to have something? Or can I choose not to have it? And my dear teacher that I'm working with at the moment and I've known for many years, Paul Harvey, once said to me, do you have the glass of wine or does the glass of wine have you? And I looked at him and I said, and he said, go away and think about it. And eventually the light bulb went on. <laughs> and it was a very pertinent awakening for me because I, I started to think more then about these relationships because they are relationships my relationship to my food, et cetera, et cetera. And this idea that freedom means, well, I'm okay if I have it, but I'm equally okay if I don't have it. If I have to have whatever it is, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a food stuff or a drink, it could be a relationship with a person or a possession or something, then I can't really claim to be free. Mm. I am dependent. And what yoga is very much about is cultivating independence. As I'm listening to you, I, I had a little moment of, oh my gosh, we're starting to sound like privileged people that have the time and space to enjoy their coffee, right? But yeah. really, as much as it is nice to have some privilege to allow that kind of space and nourishment in our lives, I also know a lot of really wealthy, privileged people don't have the nourishment and they don't have the presence and they don't have the peace and they don't have the freedom. And in fact, in my experience in working with people, the more people have in terms of power, prestige, privilege, money, the less likely they are to bring it back down to the basics. And the people who seem to, you know, from a worldly sense, have less possessions, belongings, money in their bank account, they actually seem to be able to do this more easily it's kind Absolutely. of an interesting thing well and that's because if we look at it in the way yoga might look at it kind of energetically if i have all those things even if i'm not using them at that time at some level there is an attachment and therefore that demands energy of me so i am connected in some way to all of those things, wherever I am. So even if I am trying to sit somewhere quietly in a garden, part of me is kind of wired in almost to those things. And that can be very draining. Whereas if those things don't exist or I don't have them, it does in a way leave more capacity for other things. And there's a model that I'm sure again come across and you may well use it in your practice training called the Purushata. Mm. And this is a very ancient model that's who knows how many thousand years old that talks about four basic areas of life. And one is that we need a certain amount of material possession. We need food, we need clothing, we need shelter, all depending on where we live in the world at some level. We need those things, basic human life. There's certain requirements. So there's that idea of a certain amount of, of material needs. And then there's the idea that there are certain things we need to do, each of us. If I'm a child, I have a certain responsibility to my parents, to my teachers, things like that. As an adult, I may have children, but I may also have a job. I may have older dependents. So most of us have certain roles that we need to fulfill in life. And, and that's as it is. And then there's the idea of pleasure. And people are often shocked about this because they think, what, yoga and pleasure? Can you have pleasure and practice yoga? And I'm here to tell you, absolutely you can. And as I was saying earlier, actually the practice of yoga can 
actually enhance one's appreciation of the world and the many gifts it has to offer. So that's karma, as in the Karma Sutra. So that's the three areas. And the final one is that we should have some sense of an appreciation of things that are maybe beyond the senses. Mm. And you can, if you want, call this spirituality. For some people, they may have a firm belief, a religion, a path to follow, and that's great. But if we don't belong to one of those categories, it doesn't mean that doesn't exist for us. It can be a very deep appreciation for nature, for the beauty of the natural world around us. But just something that we can appreciate that nourishes us in some way other than the material. And if each of these little boxes is being used and balanced, that will actually keep us healthy. And again, going back to my dear friend and mentor, Paul, he once said that in the modern world now, it's most about the top two, the material possessions and the pleasure. So we work hard, we earn money, and then we want to enjoy it. And the bottom half of the equation doesn't really get looked at. And so therefore, we come back to yet another imbalance, as we talked about at the beginning of the podcast. And again, I'm not saying that we can't have nice things. I mean, my partner, Helen and I are very fortunate. We live quite modestly by choice, but we have some friends in our village and they happen to own a yacht and they invite us out and take us sailing. And I am, I'm really <laughs> like, game on, let's do it. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful experience. The first time they took us out on the boat and they cut the engine and put the sails up and I can feel it now. I was welling up. Mm. It was a truly emotional moment to be held by the water and powered by the wind was profound. It was beautiful. So, as I say, we shouldn't think that to follow yoga means to deny ourselves things at all. It's more about maintaining a balance so that enjoyment doesn't become indulgence. Mm. It's very challenging, I think, for people in the world today, Amy, and particularly young people, because there is so much external pressure through these different media to be a certain way, look a certain way, buy a certain product, eat a certain product, drink a certain product, wear a certain product. And I'm sure that that's where a lot of the stresses that affect our young people come from. And I think I find that one of the saddest things that I see youngsters who should be just footloose, fancy free, enjoying their lives. And they're in therapy. They have eating problems, this, that, and the other. And it's just such a shame because that should be the most joyous stage of their life where they're beginning to explore their freedom, but they're not having to worry about paying the mortgage, paying the rent, whatever else, you know. So, again, I think this overstimulation thing can become a big problem. But, you know, it's here what to do about it. That's the thing. And I think the only thing we can do is to equip people with discrimination, to encourage people to develop the skills so they can choose. I can turn this thing off. I don't have to subscribe to this. Very much like yourself this morning, Amy. <laughs> yes, I did it. I was like, whoa, wait a minute. What am I doing here? So you know, I think this message that you just said, whether it's young people or people in their 50s or people in their 80s, this is what yoga can do. So many people hear yoga and they think, I'm not flexible. What you're talking about is, personal freedom from within to choose how to nourish yourself and how to cleanse yourself. And that's yoga. Yeah, absolutely. And perhaps a simple way to look at this is to create space. When we're stressed, anxious, depressed, it feels internally like there's nowhere to go. It just feels like we're overwhelmed. We've been crushed. How to give someone a sense of space and one of the ways I've come to look at the, the basic 
categories of tools in yoga, if you like, is that working with the body and the breath, what we sometimes call asana, some simple bodily movements with the breath helps to create space in the body. And this enables the basic functions, circulation, breathing, digestion, to function better. So we get a better basic level of wellness there. What it also does is it helps us engage with and begin this all-important relationship with the breath. Then, when we've taken some basic movements, we can sit. And it doesn't have to be lotus or cross-legged or anything. Just sit on a comfortable chair and then follow the breath a little further, which will then create space in the mind. Mm -hmm. And once we have that, we can begin to explore the space in the heart. So for me, the practice of yoga is about creating space, space in the body so it can function healthily, happily. We call it now homeostasis. We have this word homeostasis. Can things function within certain parameters? Well, we now know through neuroscience, modern research, that if we use the breath, and engage particularly with a nice, slow, smooth exhale, that will take us from the sympathetic response to the parasympathetic. So from stress or fight and flight into rest, restore and digest. Then that in itself creates space to allow us to begin to explore or experience something more profound. I could not agree more that our goal is to create space physically, chronically, mentally, emotionally, space in our relationships, space in a connection to something greater than ourselves. And that's a really unique concept specific to yoga, I think. Yeah. And the nice thing about yoga is, and the great skill of Patanjali, said by some to be the father of yoga, is that he left it very open to each individual to find their own way into this. You, there is no dogma. There is no doctrine. There is simply where you are, how you are, who you are, and that is your start point. And if that's your start point, it is valid. In other words, yoga to me, if it's truly yoga, is the most inclusive discipline you can have. And Krishnamacharya, the great professor Krishnamacharya, father of Deskachar, said, the only prerequisite to the practice of yoga is the breath. If you're breathing, you can practice yoga. And nothing is more inclusive than that. And I think this is in this age where, although we have a lot of talk about inclusivity and companies and schools and colleges have their policies, still we see some very worrying trends in the world of polarization and discrimination. And so I think anything that can unite us as humanity mm. has to be a good thing. And I believe yoga has that potential. I really do. Because when we breathe, in a way, that is an intimate relationship with the world around us. Where do we draw that breath from, the world around us? We are all breathing that same air. There is only one planet. There is only one supply of air. And so when we work in that way, we are actually linking ourselves with all the other people that do the same, which I think is quite a nice idea. I love all that you've said. And I think that's a beautiful place to end today. And I want to show people if they're watching the YouTube version of this, they can find you on your website, which is very simple and elegant, www.yogandy.com. Yogandy. Maybe it's a long A. And then they can also find you at www.tsyp.yoga, which is you know, a, a page for the Society of Yoga Practitioners. They can find you on Facebook, Andrew, yes. Andrew Curtis Payne, C-U-R-T-I-S dash P-A-Y-N-E. Yep. So thank you so much, Andy, for coming today. I really wish I had longer to talk with you. It, it just warms my heart that 
so many of us have studied with and at the KYM, and these ideas are so familiar to us, even though this is the first time we're meeting. I, I feel very connected. I feel sure that we will meet and work again. And I want to sincerely thank you for this opportunity. Although I am a busy yoga teacher, yoga therapist, yoga trainer, I am not at all good at this side of things. So I am extremely grateful to you for your acumen and for your skill and for facilitating this and making it possible. Bless you, Amy. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Look after yourselves. Thank you. A great big thank you to Andy for joining us and taking teachings that are ancient and could be complex and really boiling it down to the basics. I love what Andy said that on the intake form for a yoga therapy session, we basically ask you, how are you nourishing yourself? Are you resting? How is your activity? I mean, it's really that simple. And I think if most of us sat down and said, what are the ways I nourish myself? Am I eating good food? Organic if you can, but local food, non-processed food. Am I drinking enough liquids, specifically water? Am I letting myself sit in the sunshine on a regular basis? Am I taking walks in nature? Am I spending time with people that nourish my soul? Am I able to go to the ancient texts and get spiritual nourishment? So most people, if you ask that, they would say, absolutely not. I have no idea what you're talking about. That is not the lifestyle I'm living. Second one, are you getting enough rest? Are you sleeping well? Do you go to bed at an appropriate time? Do you sleep soundly? Do you wake up at an appropriate time? Do you feel refreshed in the morning? Or it could be, do you take rest periods during the day? Maybe you do a yoga nidra or a meditation period in the afternoon, or just you just sit and feel and breathe. You know, a lot of times when I get in my car after a whirlwind of a workday, I won't turn on a podcast. I won't turn on the radio. I just want to be quiet for 10 minutes and drive home. That's kind of a mental rest period. And then are you moving? And it doesn't have to be hardcore, you know, hit training or running marathons. That's not what we're talking about. We're are you able to move your body comfortably? And that can happen through walking. That can happen through gentle yoga practice. There's many, many ways that someone could move within the yoga therapy scope of practice. So when you boil it down to those three things, am I getting nourished? Am I getting enough rest? Am I getting enough activity? That's what a yoga therapist does. And it's a very broad definition of nourishment, rest, and activity. It's not just what you do on a yoga mat in terms of asana. As you heard Andy talk about it, it's it's very broad. So I loved the simplicity and the common sense approach and the recognition that this is what the world needs. This is what humanity needs. And we're not doing it. Even though it sounds simple, people are not doing it. They're getting more and more detached and disembodied and connected to something outside of themselves instead of that inner GPS. So thank you, Andy, for all these wonderful reminders. And if you're listening to this and you think you may want to try yoga therapy, we have many different ways you can do that. We have a mobile app called Optimal State on Android and Apple. We have the Monday Night Yoga Therapy Clinic. If you'd like to join us for that, every month is a new topic. You can come to amywheeler.com. We have a yoga therapy school. If you're looking to really jump in and maybe find a new career, we would love to talk to you about that. So thank you for joining us and we will see you soon. A special thank you to our team here at Optimal State. We are truly a global family. George Mantuan, one of our executive producers. Adam Satchel, senior media producer and sound engineer from the Philippines. Krishna Panchal, a producer from Canada. Modupe Abdullahi, who does the show notes and is an editor for us from Nigeria, and Peter Morley, who wrote and produced the music for this show, who lives in Australia. Find more about Peter's work at www.zenmusic.biz. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.